All right, I think we're ready to go. Thank you for coming to the last press conference of today, the Geoscience Grab Bag number two. This is a new format for us that we're trying out. So we have five great speakers here and we'll be talking about completely different things. So what we're gonna do is have each person give their presentation and then we'll take a couple questions from the audience and then we'll move on to the next person. And we're gonna see how that goes. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Jenna Hill from the US Geological Survey as our first speaker. And we'll have Andrew Hooper from the University of Leeds, Alexander Kosovtiev from the New Jersey Institute of Technology. Then we'll do local Sol Luca Solari from the University of Florence. And last will be Alex Nikulin from Birmingham University. And so, Jenna. All right, well, thank you. So my presentation, uh, my, I have a poster presentation on Thursday uh, on the timing of subtropical iceberg transport and meltwater flows in the deglacial North Atlantic. And essentially, our previous work has shown fairly good evidence of very large icebergs and large numbers of icebergs that have drifted south from melting ice sheets in North America that have come along the Atlantic coast of the US um, all the way down the coast as far south as the, the Florida Keys. Uh, but one of the key questions that's been remaining in, in this research is when this happened. Was this an ancient event or was it something more recent? Did it happen more than once? Um, or was this a kind of extreme one-off event? And our new data suggests that in fact, this is relatively recent in geologic history. It happened in, over the multiple times over the past 30,000 years. Uh, and this is sort of important in terms of our understanding of where freshwater um, both is input to the ocean and then how it circulates throughout the ocean, and then ultimately how that changes ocean circulation and global climate as a result of that. So previously, it was thought that most of the, the um, freshwater from the North American ice sheet um, came into uh, the North Atlantic here, largely from um, Hudson Bay in Canada here, and then circulated out into the, the subpolar regions of the North Atlantic, um, um, where we see evidence of good numbers of icebergs that were entrained or kind of circulated here in the subpolar gyre. What our new evidence suggests is that, in fact, while that may have occurred, you may have had large numbers of icebergs out here, a significant volume of freshwater actually um, comes down the coast and stays in these coastal meltwater currents that hug the coast here and come all the way down um, past the, the breakoff point for the Gulf Stream all the way down to the tip of Florida. And they bring large numbers of icebergs and a large volume of, of fresh water with them. Um, and then that fresh water is then being diverted away from the polar regions and into the subtropical regions, uh, where it can have a large scale impact on global ocean circulation. Um, that's a little bit unexpected based on the way that we thought that this sort of, of pattern worked before. And as I said, we think this is not just a one time extreme event, but rather that this occurred multiple times um, as the ice sheet was starting to break up uh, from North America. And so looking into this a little bit, um, part of what we've done is uh, some detailed high resolution ocean circulation modeling. Most of that, that work has been done by my colleague, Alan Condren, who is at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. Um, and what he's been able to show is essentially how this meltwater current and what you're seeing here, the bluer colors are fresher water. Um, and the enlargement here have come down the coast of the southeast of the US. Um, but more importantly, what we see is a sustained freshening effect of how this meltwater then is jetted out into the subpolar gyre here, into the subtropical regions. It diverts a large amount of, of fresh water away from the polar regions and brings this fresh water here into the, the subtropics. We actually have new results from a newer model that includes icebergs in the model. We've actually been able to, to model the path and track of icebergs that we see quite well as, as well. But this is important because we see more of this freshening here in the subtropics. And so this leads us to, to questions about how that actually affects ocean circulation what those changes um, might be. And then also thinking in the future about ice sheets that are melting in Greenland and Antarctica and places like that, how that meltwater will get uh, routed throughout the ocean, how that might affect ocean circulation patterns. And like I said, ultimately, ultimately global climate. That's sort of what we're, we're after here. Um, so some of the evidence that sort of led us down this path of thinking that these icebergs and meltwater actually came down the, the coast of the, the southeastern portion of the U.S. Um, comes from mostly from iceberg scours. And these are examples of iceberg scours that you can see on the seafloor. And so when I say iceberg scours, we're typically talking about the idea of grounding of iceberg keels. Um, as they ground as into shallow water, the iceberg keels can drag along the, and create these kind of uh, ridges that we see uh, on the seafloor here. They create these kind of characteristic grounding pat, uh, 
grounding pit features, and both of these features are off the coast of South Carolina at about 33 degrees north latitude, um, so relatively far south um, that we see these things. Um, we also see evidence um, all the way as far south as I noted as the, the Florida Keys, so the very tip of Florida at about 24 degrees um, north latitude, um, is where we see a lot of these kinds of, of iceberg scour features. And they're very characteristic of what you'd expect to see in polar regions, except for that here we are in the, in the subtropics. Um, and we think that these essentially suggest that icebergs about 300 meters thick, which is about the equivalent of about 10 stories of iceberg above the water line. So we're talking very, very large icebergs um, that would have been drifting right along the coast. Um, sea level would have been lower at the time. These would have been right along the coast, um, about a 70 to 100 miles offshore of the modern coastline, but right where the coastline would have been at the, the time the icebergs were coming through. Um, so most of the cases where we see these at the seafloor, um, these are areas where the icebergs have come into shallow water and grounded on rocky seafloor where there's not a lot of sediment. Um, to be able to figure out how old the iceberg scours were and when these things actually occurred, um, we look for places where they're actually buried in the sediment. Um, and so to do that, we use a chirp sub-bottom sonar, which essentially is a sonar that looks at layers beneath the seafloor. So we look for places where there's buried scours, and that's what we can see in this area um, off the coast of South Carolina. You can see we were very close to what would have been the shoreline at the time that icebergs were coming through here. And we look for a place where you can see these scours have been filled in with sediment. And then essentially I took uh, sediment samples or sediment cores um, and looked for a surface of erosion where we can see an abrupt change here from very fine grain to very coarse grain um, sediment here that corresponds to what we see in the sonar data. And then use radiocarbon dates uh, from foraminifera shells um, above and below that surface essentially to constrain the, the timing of erosion in there. And that's where we come up with multiple events, like I said, that have occurred um, over the past 30,000 years that suggests that this, this was a recurring um, pattern where these meltwater was entrained in these coastal currents. So in summary, <clears throat> kind of our, our key points are this idea that icebergs both drifted all the way south, like I said, down to 24 and a half degrees uh, north latitude, and these coastal meltwater currents that this occurred multiple times, and rather than being a one-off extreme event, this seems to be something that happens when you have uh, releases of large amounts of, of fresh water um, from the, these uh, waning glaciers. Um, that a lot of this fresh water went directly into the, the subtropics and away from the polar regions, which really sort of changes the way that we think about how fresh water impacts um, ocean circulation. It has a very different um, effect in terms of uh, the response of ocean circulation to that fresh water. And then it also sort of highlights our need to understand places that are melting today, like Greenland and Antarctica, where the large volumes of fresh water might be going, how that might affect global ocean circulation, and like I said, ultimately global climate patterns. Thank you. Great. Can we take a couple questions from reporters in the audience about, or Jennifer? Please state your name and affiliation. <coughs> Hi, Sid Perkins from, uh, I'm a freelancer. <coughs> do you see a difference in depth over time at which these things are occurring and does that help you track the sea level rise during time out of the last deglaciation or is it just kind of scattershot in different areas or? Um, so that's an excellent question and I would, uh, we would love to have samples from multiple areas to be able to look at that. I don't seem to be able to go back, but um, essentially I was able to get samples from a fairly narrow depth band where there's actually sediment. Most of the places where, like I said, where you see the evidence of the iceberg scours, there's not a lot of sediment to actually recover samples to be able to get ages. Um, so they're, they're mostly from a relatively small area in about 200 meters of water depth. Um, but like I said, I think we see at, both in the sonar data and in what we get from the sediment samples, evidence that there's multiple erosional events. Um, it doesn't really help us get at sea level, but it does help us sort of look at the chronology and and um, size of icebergs too. More questions? Questions from the chat? <coughs> All right, we're gonna turn this over to Andrew Hooper, who's gonna talk to us about volcanoes. Thank you. Okay. Oh, there we go. Yeah, so I'm going to be talking about uh, automatic detection of deformation 
at volcanoes globally. Uh, so I'm Andy Heap, I'm, I'm a professor of geophysics at the University of Leeds, but actually most of this work was done by my PhD student, Matt Gaddis, so I should have put a photo of, of him there, I think. Um, so by some estimates, about 200 million people live in the risk zone of active volcanoes. But most volcanoes in the world are not instrumented. Only some 100 of, out of the 1,400 which have the potential to erupt are actually instrumented. Um, and unfortunately, every year we get eruptions that, that cause uh, fatalities. Um, in addition, eruptions can have huge economic consequences, uh, sometimes costing in the billions of dollars. So there's a couple of examples in 2010. There was AE50 Yokel in Iceland and Merapi in Indonesia that, that both had consequences uh, running into the billions. Um, and actually, there's the potent, even the potential for eruption is actually a barrier to economic development as well. So what have we done? Well, we've developed a machine learning algorithm that can automatically detect changes in activity at volcanoes globally based on satellite data. Uh, so this works because as, as magma moves beneath volcanoes, it causes uh, deformation at the surface. Um, there's uh, some dumb examples here, but you can imagine if inflating a balloon beneath the surface is going to cause the, the surface to rise and move outwards. If you deflate it, it'll move uh, downwards and towards the center again. Um, and actually, also, if you get magma that's moving laterally, that also shows up in, at the surface as well, as long as it's no, not too deep. So since uh, about end of 2014, the Sentinel-1 uh, radar satellites have been active. Well, the first one was launched uh, in 2014 and became operational in 20, in the end of 2014. So since then, we've been getting images over every volcano um, that, that sticks out above the, the surface of the ocean at least uh, two times every 12 days. So this gives us a global day. This, this gives us the ability to actually monitor volcanoes globally um, for the first time. And we can take these data and we can uh, make these kind of images which show us deformation um, at the surface. So what you can see here are these colored fringes. The best way to interpret them is as kind of contours of, of displacement towards or away from a satellite. So if you look at the, the, the images on the left here, uh, labeled Cerro Azul, this is the volcano in the Galapagos, um, and the upper concentric rings are showing deflation. Uh, as magma is withdrawn from beneath the, the summit caldera. And then, let's see, so that's this area here. Um, down here, we can see inflation. So the magma's moved laterally in this case. Uh, it didn't erupt, but it did move laterally. So we can image this kind of subtle deformation um, at the surface. Uh, there's another volcano here, Sierra Negra, that I'll talk more about in a moment, um, which is also, um, this put, this, during this period, was inflating. So it's the order of the color that tells us whether it's inflating or deflating. So uh, over the last few years, we've been developing the system that takes all of these data for over large parts of the Earth and processes it automatically. This has not been without its problems in itself, actually, just uh, processing huge quantities of data. Um, so including this system, we're, we're trying to image all this, the straining regions of the Earth, starting with the Alpine Himalayan belt, but also all the volcanoes in the world. So for instance, all down the, the west coast of the Americas here, you can see these, these um, images of, of volcanoes that have been acquired during this time. So the new bit, the, the bit that uh, I'm talking about at this conference, is the machine learning algorithms that take these process data with deformation and try and do something useful with it um, and, and detect when there's, there's some new deformation happening. So th the motivation for this is, of course, that we can't look at all these data for 1,400 volcanoes all the time um, when we're getting hundreds of images a day. So this is showing you data over one volcano. Along the top are the actual images of, of deformation that you don't have to worry too much about. Um, but these images down the left here are the components we identify in a training set. So during the time period up to this, this line here, we, this is our training period, and we've tried to identify what are the background signals, because we'd like to know not just is there deformation, but is there deformation that's different to what we've been experiencing in the past. So we use these training data to identify different components of either deformation or actually atmospheric signals, so that we do get atmospheric signals caught up in these images as well. So each of these images on the left is one of these components. And then what you see in, the, in, the ser in this time course here, so this is years along the bottom, is um, how it's progressing cumulatively in time. So if we look at this top one, this is actually the main signal of inflation, this volcano Sierra Negra in the Galapagos that I just talked about. And it's more or less inflating at a steady state rate. You can just see an upward trend of this line. 
Um, and then these are green dots. You get to these red dots. That, that means that something different is happening. In this case, there was a change of rate, an acceleration uh, in this inflation. Then it went drop down again. We, they sort of go green again. But then here we get to this point. Um, and let me see. Yeah. So these are showing accelerations of this caldera uplift, these, these inflections here. So this is a, a kind of warning system. We can then look, at, look and see in more detail what's going on. But the idea is that the computer itself can tell us um, when something different is happening. Um, the other thing we look at is the residuals. So we try and fit each new image of deformation with the sources we know about. And if we can't, we have a residual. Um, and that implies there's some new source of deformation. So there are two things we're trying to detect, either a change in rate of existing deformation or um, new patterns of deformation. We see two examples of that here, um, a, a subtle one, first of all, here. But then actually here, this was associated with an eruption. So there was a big jump up at this point um, when Sierra Negra erupted. Um, and of course, there, there was a completely different deformation style. Uh, so just to summarize then, uh, we, we're using machine learning to and applying it to satellite data. Um, and using this, we can detect changes in activity uh, globally at volcanoes. Um, the next step is actually to use neural network approaches um, to take in all of these data that we processed and actually try and forecast future scenarios at volcanoes as well. Thanks very much. Okay, any questions from the reporters in the audience for Andrew? Are there any questions on the chat? <coughs> One question for Andrew Christoph Seidler, Spiegel Online. Um, so I, um, I see from the data that something is going on, but um, in how far does that translate to something on the ground that needs to be done? Do, do, do you sit there in Leeds and say, mm, that's interesting, and somebody else has to take care of it? Or what, what do we do once we see there is something interesting uh, coming out of your, your algorithm? Yeah, so that, that's a good question. So we haven't got this implemented in, let's say, any um, way now. But the obvious things to do would be to put out, when you see something interesting happening, is to put out more grand inst instrumentation. So the first thing we would do is to tell the, the volcano observatory that's responsible for that particular volcano. And then they can take those decisions on, on what to do next. Any more questions? All right, I'm going to move on. Sorry. Some questions on the chat. Question on the chat. Um, so, a uh, question from Kathleen O'Neill, freelance. What is the scale of deformation? Is groundwater depletion an issue? Oh, that's a good question, yeah. So, we, we can pick up deformation on the order of, of, of about a centimeter, in some cases, millimeters. Um, but it's a kind of centimeter type deformation. In some cases, we do actually see deformation, of course, which is much greater, but that's the, the level of sensitivity we have. Is groundwater a problem? So, we do find that some volcanoes, um, there, are, there are active hydrogen. You know, geothermal systems, hydrothermal systems that do actually uh, cause a signal as well. But this would fall into the, 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 the kind of background deformation that um, we're trying to pick up in the training period. So as long as nothing's changing, then it wouldn't flag. It's only if we see some new signal of deformation that, that we flag it. OK, and uh, one more question from David Appel, freelance. Is anything different in your data when an eruption is approaching? Yeah, so um, actually the one example I showed here, this was, it was actually um, essentially a forewarning of eruption. So we saw this inflation um, accelerating in the years preceding the eruption. So in, in this case, yes, it was a forewarning of, of eruption. Um, we've done some modeling of that as well, which is outside of what I'm talking about. But um, using modeling techniques, we can, we can narrow down when we expect an eruption to occur if it carries on uh, accelerating at that rate. Thank you. Thanks. Our next speaker is Alexander Sosovichev. He's going to talk to us about the sun. Um, <clears throat> my presentation is about um, uh, how we can learn about the uh, origins of uh, solar activity cycles. It's uh, been known for centuries that sunspots appear with 11-year uh, cycles. And here, we observe sunspots already for more than four centuries. And they form a butterfly diagram uh, the sunspots uh, at the beginning of the cycle first appear at mid latitudes, and then sunspot uh, migration zone, uh, the sunspot zone migrates towards the equator. And uh, what is the origin of this, uh, of, of this phenomenon? And um, in um, 1955, Parker postulated that the butterfly diagram is caused by dynamo waves. Dynamo is a process of magnetic field generation inside the sun, and magnetic fields are generated in the deep interior of the sun and transported to the surface in the form of dynamo waves. 
our results, our results provide the first observation evidence of dynamo waves. I have this little demonstration, it's a dynamo machine, and uh, it has a coil here and a magnet, and when I rotate, the coil generates electric currents, and electric currents produce magnetic field. Similar process occurs in, inside the sun, and uh, convective motions role, uh, play the uh, 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 role of the handle. So con uh, continuous convective motions and rotation of the sun uh, produce magnetic field, and that's, uh, uh, that's a dynamo process inside the sun. Uh, so what we found that by tracking, we don't, see don't observe magnetic field directly inside the sun. We observe a stream jet inside the sun. And by looking at um, the stream jet patterns and how they accelerate, decelerate, we're able to track the dynamo waves. The magnetic field uh, causes tension of um, stream jets uh, called torsion oscillations. And this is uh, blue features here in this movie. And we can see that uh, these blue features, they, uh, they travel as, uh, as a wave inside the sun. So that's uh, evidence of dynamo waves. So this data, this helix seismology data allowed us to pin down location of uh, solar dynamo and that magnetic field originates the bottom of the convection zone here at high latitudes, at um, about 60 degrees latitudes. And then uh, uh, that uh, this um, um, uh, dynamo wave propagates towards the surface. Uh, one of the puzzles in uh, solar cycles was that uh, one of the best predictions we have is to measure polar magnetic field, this latitude, this is time, that's a magnetic field strength. We have uh, polarity reversals every 11 years. If you measure polar magnetic field, it predicts, it's the best prediction of the next uh, sunspot cycles, and sunspots appear at low latitudes. And our results explain why it's, uh, why it's prediction, how it ha why it happens. Uh, and uh, the technique that we use, uh, if, uh, it's called uh, helioseismology. So observed um, acoustic waves inside the sun, observed acoustic waves on the solar surface, and these solar oscillations, they tell us about the interior. We decompose oscillation signal into normal modes, and here you can see an example of one of the normal modes, oscillation modes of the sun, and we measure the very precisely these, uh, frequencies of these oscillations and their variations, and from this we infer um, interior, interior structure and flows. Here again, these are patterns of um, uh, dynamo waves inside the sun, and the arrow shows um, uh, that where the originally the magnetic field is generated by the dynamo process that I showed you. And uh, this is the last um, frame, it shows uh, 2018, and here we can see the start of the next um, solar cycle. At low latitudes, we can see the progression of, uh, of the current solar cycle, which is about the end, uh, so that, um, uh, that uh, we are we allowed to pin, the, pin um, down location of, um, of, of solar dynamo. Uh, also, we can track uh, the migration of dynamo waves, and uh, they travel with a speed of um, two or four miles per hour, and uh, they reach very quickly in one, two years from the bottom convection zone, they reach uh, polar regions. And it takes um, about 10 years for this wave to go to the equatorial region. And this is why the polar magnetic field predicts, uh, uh, predicts uh, the uh, sunspot number. Uh, now the big question is that uh, how it relates to the solar cycles. This is um, the history of um, observation of sunspots uh, from since the telescope was invented by Galileo uh, in uh, 1600, uh, uh, it's in, and there were some periods of um, deep minimum of solar activity, and now it uh, it looks like that we are going to the uh, next minimum. It's a questionable, but it's a decline in the last few cycles, decline in solar activity. Uh, so now we can um, look at the next solar cycle, and already in the interior of the sun, we can see the development of cycle, it's called cycle number 25, and we can see it's much weaker. So these blue regions, it, uh, it's a uh, depth, and it shows how these waves travel uh, from the deep interior to the surface here, that was the previous cycle, and the new cycle already see it's, uh, it's uh, developing in the interior, and it looks much weaker than the current cycle, so this indicates that maybe it's further decline of solar activity. Uh, so this data, that helicosmology data were obtained from uh, two NASA space missions. It's continuous observations of the sun from solar heliospheric observatory and now from solar dynamics observatory. And uh, it's, uh, this data shows it's very important to continue monitoring uh, solar interior by heliosismology. Thank you. Thank you, Alexander. Do we have any questions from reporters in the audience? John 
Ken Celosi, Freelance. I just wonder how closely you feel that the solar activity is tied to, temperature, tied to temperatures on the Earth and, and our climate. And if, if the solar activity is going down and Earth's temperatures are going up, is that, how do, how do you feel about that in terms of some of the things that are talked about in terms of climate science and so forth? Well, solar activity was um, uh, also in the past. We have already seen uh, um, uh, the changes in, um, in, in solar cycles. So it, we, we don't know the origin of these uh, big cycles and uh, uh, the implications. It also, it's, uh, it's kind of debatable, obviously, that uh, variations of, uh, of solar activity, they affect uh, uh, Earth's environment, space environment, uh, space weather, and also a state of uh, Earth's atmosphere is strongly affected by uh, solar radiation. And it's uh, what's most important that during solar cycle, uh, that UV radiation changes uh, quite substantially. And this effects, uh, it has uh, dramatic effects in, uh, on uh, Earth's atmosphere. Uh, so that if, uh, what, what if we, we still don't have a complete theory of solar cycle, it will be very important to develop a theory so we can uh, combine with uh, observations and make uh, more robust predictions of solar cycles. But that's, uh, that's the current stage of our knowledge now. Some more questions from the audience? Questions from chat? Huh? All right, next up we have Luca Solari. He's gonna talk to us about crayfish. Good afternoon, thank you. So my talk is about uh, the invasive crayfish and uh, these animals, these species, how are damaging uh, city infrastructures. The kind of infrastructure we're talking today is about uh, river levees. Um, I'm from the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering, University of Florence. I would like also to acknowledge my colleagues from uh, the Department of Biology. And uh, river levees uh, are uh, structures uh, that uh, they, their main purpose is to retain water so that protecting sur uh, surrounding lands from flooding. But uh, these structures can fail. And uh, basically, there are two types of mechanism for this failing. One is uh, overtopping. When you have uh, a major flood and water level goes uh, above the top of the levee. But another type of mechanism is related to the seepage. So that is the, uh, the filtration process, the, 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 uh, the flow inside the, the levee. And uh, this is an example of, oh, sorry. This is an example of what happened in this case in, in this river. The question is, uh, uh, when you have seepage, you can have some internal erosion, and this internal erosion can lead to eventually to the formation of a bridge. The question is, in this case, why we have internal erosion? One of the, the causes, uh, and this is a new, let's say, uh, mechanism that, that has been uh, highlighted in a recent paper, is due to the animal borrowing. Because uh, uh, due to the lack of, of uh, biogeographical barriers, nowadays we have uh, uh, many uh, wildlife uh, living on, the, on these uh, levees, and th th these animals, they, make, uh, they dig into the levees, they make scour, and uh, so they alter the, uh, both from a structural and hydraulic point of view the, the levee function functionality. So in this example, again in Italy, and uh, you can see here there's, a, there's, a, there's basically a flow that uh, is, is going from the river to the sur surrounding lengths, and this is like a pipe, pipe, pipe flow that is starting from uh, the scour and uh, the, the, the cavities due to, animal, due to an animal. And these are the consequences. You have the breach, and you have the inundation, the flooding of the sur by, uh, surrounding lands. And uh, in, in this sketch, uh, we, we, uh, what happens uh, from a hydraulic point of view when you have uh, a borrowing of uh, animal borrowing? So you can expect when you have uh, river flooding, when you have uh, um, flooding in, um, in, uh, in rivers, so water levels are pretty high, you can have a seepage process, these lines. So water starts filtrate, filtrating from the riverside to the land side. However, if the levee is well designed, and it should be, of course, the time that the water takes to, to reach the land side is so slow compared to the time scale of the flood, so that uh, the, the, the water is uh, in, the, in that time uh, during the flood, uh, does not reach the, the, the land side of the levee. Because when that happens, then you have the levee failure. 
When you have uh, cavities uh, due to an animal borrowing, of course you can expect that there are a shortening of the seepage path, and uh, so it's a shortening of the time scale for seepage for the water to reach the uh, land side of the levee. And uh, in this case, you can expect uh, uh, the levee to be much more vulnerable to seepage processes. And uh, here in this work, the, the, the aim is to evaluate the, the, the scour due to the Procamarus clarki, which is uh, an invasive species in Europe. And uh, it was, uh, it's, it's a native from North America, in particular around the Gulf of Mexico, Louisiana. And uh, it uh, was first introduced originally in Spain, 1973, for aquaculture, then escaped, and now it's uh, uh, in all the Mediterranean area, in south of Europe, but, but also in England. And uh, it, the animal is, is not big because it's, uh, the, the, the body length is about 10 centimeters, up to 10 centimeters, but uh, the digging and discovering is pretty intense, as you will see. And this animal actually is included in this regulation that was uh, uh, emanated by the European Union in 2015, and where here uh, the, this regulation contains a list of the, you know, the species that uh, have the worst impact on the environment. And the program of Skarki, this, this crayfish, uh, is, is included in that list. This, this uh, regulation also includes a set of measures for the management and also for the eradication of a new population of, of Procambro. Procambrus clarki. So we wanted to, to see, to evaluate the scar activity, we went to the field, and uh, so here is a, is a channel in a, in a, in a yeah, nearby in Toscany, and uh, here I have, uh, you see a picture of the, 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 the crayfish that is digging, here sometimes you can see uh, chimneys around the, the, the hole, and the diameter is, uh, is around 5-6 cm on average. And uh, here I have highlighted in red the entrance of the galleries of the cavities, uh, and uh, I just put these, these, these uh, red ones because there are so many that will be all uh, jammed with uh, so many red circles. So we, uh, we, we injected some foam inside these cavities because we wanted to see uh, what is the morphology and the geometry of these cavities. And uh, here I have an example of uh, what uh, those animals can, can do. And uh, these are, uh, for, for instance, in this case, we have uh, three entrances, one, two, three. And uh, there's one cavity, which is uh, here, one the, the chamber. And uh, this is one shape, possible shape that we observe. And then this is more regular shape. That is, we have just one single entrance and then uh, is mostly a kind of cylindrical shape. But also we, we observe as, a, as a here one entrance with two tunnels. So, and the length of these cavities is, uh, this tunnel is from uh, 15 to 50 centimeters, with the density of several barrels for, per square meters. So now we want to see the implication of that uh, on the hydraulics, uh, and uh, to, so, to do that we, uh, we, um, we implemented some numerical model uh, and, uh, to, um, to simulate the, the uh, filtration process, the, the seepage process uh, inside uh, an uh, undamaged levy and uh, uh, levy, the same levy but with a borrow. So if you look at this, this picture on the left, we see that uh, here is the liver side, this is the water level. This blue line, dash blue line, is the saturation line. So it means that the water is, uh, uh, after 30, 48 minutes in this case, uh, has arrived uh, to this point uh, in the levy. So, uh, but if you consider the same boundary condition, the, the, same, the same water, uh, water uh, level in the, in the river, but we consider uh, the same levy, the same geometry, but with the borrow, of course the borrow, what, the, what it does is that uh, it pushes the saturation line in further inside the levy, and uh, in this case, after 38 minutes, this is the same time as before, we have that the saturation line has uh, reached the uh, river side, the, the land side of the levee. So in, the, in that case, uh, you can expect the levee failure. So uh, the take home, take home messages, uh, here uh, is uh, also a little movie about uh, what we saw in the field uh, is that uh, uh, we saw that uh, Procambrus clarpy, those crayfish are able to actively make borrows and uh, uh, scouring the, the banks and the channels with the length of between 15 and 50 centimeters. And also they can uh, alter, industrially alter the hydraulics uh, of uh, uh, the, those levees. And so this means that uh, uh, the levees, uh, this increase the vulnerability to seepage flow and may lead to the levee failure. Thank you very much. Thank you, Luca. Do we have questions from the audience? Questions from chat? No questions. Hi. 
Hi, um, Liz Gallagher from Physics World. You talked about the earlier paper in 2015 that also saw burrowing. Was that the same with that crayfish as well, or do other animals? Yeah, it's uh, also it's uh, about bi biota and it's like uh, fish, uh, other animals, but also uh, yes, vegetation. Yes, yeah. So it includes uh, about 100 uh, biota elements. Let's say yes. More questions for Luca? Okay, thank you. Our last speaker tonight will be Alex Nakula. He's going to talk to us about landmines. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for coming. I actually learned a lot today, so thank everybody else. <laughs> um, so my talk is a little bit different. Uh, it focuses on the um, a different approach to the uh, attempting to address the landmine problem, specifically using infrared waves to detect a very specific type of landmine that is otherwise virtually undetectable. So um, while I'd love to take all the credit, there's this actually a team effort. My um, name is Alex Nikulin. The other uh, members on our team are Tim Desmet, uh, Jasper Bauer, and William Fraser. You know, we have a few presentations at AGU, and we hopefully you can attend those as well. Uh, the landmine idea uh, dates all the way back to the beginning of the, 19, uh, the beginning of the 20th century, and landmines were essentially weapons of defense. Uh, they were large. They were placed uh, along. Um, very well-planned um, routes. And this made their subsequent removal, uh, for example, in the aftermath of World War II, relatively easy. Um, unfortunately, many, many places since uh, the, the, the very approach changed. Uh, mines have become smaller, and they've become a lot, lot harder to detect. Okay? It is currently estimated there are about 100 million landmines uh, out there uh, that are still yet to be removed. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, uh, while the actual method of detecting landmines has, has virtually stayed the same, you can see there's, this, is a, this is a picture from um, World War II, which shows a person using an electromagnetic metal detector to locate a, a suspicious object below the surface. Another person literally is poking it. And that is still today the standard math method of actual demining and mine detection. As you will see this throughout, you will see the classic um, mine detector, which is basically an electromagnetic induction coil. And while this method has essentially stayed stable, the landmine technology itself has changed dramatically uh, along three very specific vectors. Um, a reduction of explosive charge, a reduction of size, and a reduction of metal content. Uh, essentially, mines, instead of becoming weapons meant to d destroy a vehicle or, or kill a person, they have been become maiming devices. And as such, they have become used as essentially tools of punishment in areas like Afghanistan, where a particular type of landmine, this PFM-1 plastic landmine, uh, has become so prominent that it has uh, basically caused entire areas of the country to become impassable to this day. So here's what it looks like. It is a plastic-shaped charge. It doesn't has, has very little metal content. It has no shrapnel. Everything is wrapped in plastic, and the explosive itself is liquid. I have actually uh, an inert one with me. As you can see, it's about uh, the size of maybe uh, a modern iPhone, about actually half, half the size of that. They are dispersed from the air in special shells um, and 18 packs, and then their distribution is completely random. So they cannot be mapped while they are dispersed. Furthermore, they are irreversible. Once triggered, the, this mine cannot actually be disarmed. Um, what we saw in this design is essentially an attempt to avo avoid uh, traditional detection. Every single thing about this mine is done in a way that it is not detectable by electromagnetic induction methods. And we saw that as a chance to actually use a different method to try to approach this problem. Uh, what we saw 
is because the, uh, the, uh, the landmine is made of plastic mostly and the, has a liquid explosive charge, its thermal inertia, meaning the rate of its cooling and heating, is drastically different from any of its host environments, be that vegetation or, uh, as it is more common, kind of the rocks and sands of high altitude Afghanistan. And then we did a number of experiments going from stationary to dynamic to basically establish a way to identify these without ever putting a person in direct contact with the minefield. And what we did was we put a thermal imaging camera on a commercially available drone and flew a pre-programmed route at different time intervals. For example, one at sunrise, 15 minutes after that, 50 minutes after that, 50 minutes after that, repeating them. And essentially, we were able to find the thermal anomalies associated with the position of these landmines very accurately. Okay. Uh, in our experiments, we report significantly reduced time and equipment costs associated with the use of this AV, a UAV mounted system. Here's an example of what the data actually looks like. We see the thermal anomaly in the infrared spectrum, which we then can compare to a visible light spectrum. As you can see, we can see the mine in its upright position, flipped position, and even when it's standing on its side. Elements of its casing, the aluminum casing, are even, even more visible because aluminum has a very, very high reflectivity. So we're easily, we're easily able to find both elements of the casing and the landmine elements themselves. Um, throughout our uh, dynamic experiments, we were consistently able to detect PFM1 landmine presence, the orientation of the field, which is ballistic, and signs of possible field overlap, so there, where, there, where there are two or more fields present in the same area. And as a result, this method allows to dramatically constrain the search area for uh, subsequent destruction of these landmines. Uh, we have had a series of publications on this, uh, from the leading edge to remote sensing, and most recently in the Journal of Conventional Weapons Destruction. And we hope to, essentially, the next step in this research is to train a, an algorithm to actually automate detection. And that's what we're hoping to uh, accomplish at this conference. We're hoping to talk to folks who are, who are actually uh, better coders than we are, because unfortunately we are geologists. But uh, So we're very excited to share our results. Um, our methods and our algorithms with any NGO and any research team that's interested in helping us out with the, kind of the next phase of this. Uh, our posters can be found on Wednesday um, along with the presentation. So we hope we get to see, you guys will also get a chance to see those. So that's it. Oops. Thank you, Alex. Sorry. Yeah.